working on is it yet. So we are episode number 51 now. And we are uh, in Bournemouth at the moment at the Bournemouth uh, sort of conference centre, the BIC. And um, these are the uh, speakers that were performing to the musculoskeletal session, the MSK UK session. And the topic was patellofemoral pain and it's, uh, it's proximal considerations, it's distal considerations and, and considerations surrounding uh, gait and gait retraining. So uh, just to introduce uh, the, the speakers here, this, this, this here is, uh, this is weird, I'm not normally in the same room as people. This is uh, uh, Simon, Simon Lack, he's a physiotherapist. This is Brad Neal, uh, another physiotherapist, and this is Alice Corbett. Uh, who's a podiatrist, and all of them uh, work in London at Pure Sports Medicine, uh, along with myself, and so we all know each other, we're friends slash colleagues, or colleagues slash friends, and uh, we, yeah, these guys delivered the session to try and sort of, I guess, uh, get the message across to the room that the patellofemoral pain is a uh, common, well, Simon's going to go into this in a minute, but a very common problem that we would expect to see as podiatrists. It is, it, uh, there is a layer of complexity to it that stems way beyond is the foot pronated, throw in a meat pie and, and, and send them on their way. And we really just wanted to get that, that message across and, and show people what a, what a team approach is often required to get the best outcome. So we thought we'd just use this session as we were all in the same place and from the conference center to, I guess, summarize this morning's session. Uh, we've got a few slides that we might share as well to sort of support that. Um, what we did earlier was Simon gave a, a sort of a bit of an intro about what patellofemoral pain is. I thought I might pass him in a second and get him to do that. And then we'll talk a bit about top down, bottom up and gate, gate retraining. And then we'll just see where the conversation takes us. So um, Simon, over to you, sir. Yeah. Do you, so do you want to uh, share the screen now? I'll share the screen and, and just take, take you guys through it. So... Um, <clears throat> So this was this was the sort of theme of the session, really, which is that uh, you know, it's all about the knee. And what uh, what was the first thing really that was important to say is that uh, if that takes it it's important that we're talking about the same thing fundamentally when we're talking about diagnosis of patellofemoral pain. Fundamentally, what are we talking about? And and we're talking about a knee complaint that is. Uh, in or around or local to the patella it, it's insidious in onset and fundamentally it's a diagnosis of exclusion so it's in the absence of concomitant pathology and what we're tending to find and what the literature would suggest is that this particular pain complaint is aggravated by squatting stair ambulation running and jogging as a pain complaint it's common and what, we, what the literature would suggest in terms of general population, approximately 22%, 23% of individuals of annual prevalence will be experiencing patellofemoral pain. In the adolescent population, this number is greater, it's nearly 30%. And this study that was completed by Ben Smith and, and colleagues looked at or, or found some literature that looked at elite cyclists and found that 35 plus percent of elite cyclists will be experiencing uh, patellofemoral pain. So we've got a common complaint. Now, when we talk about treating any complaint fundamentally, but certainly when it comes to patellofemoral pain, we're not treating a diagnosis. What we're, what we're aiming to do is to identify what are the deficits that these individuals have. And, and fundamentally from that, formulating a treatment plan. So when we look at the literature around patellofemoral pain, there looks to be domains that are fundamental deficits that can drive the nociceptive process. And the first of which is, is the way in which some individuals are built. So it could be a structural component. There's an aspect of how they move about how they're built. So there's biomechanics and the volume or frequency or intensity of training or exercise or whatever activity it may be that they're putting down through that knee joint, that, that can drive, be the driver of symptoms. And because this is all occurring within humans and, and pain is largely an experience of the body and brain, our psychology or psychosocial factors will influence the magnitude with which that nociceptive drive is expressed and, and from which they'll present to us with patellofemoral pain. So we've got, a, we've got a condition that is common and it's in and around the kneecap and it's got a number of factors that 
are deficits that can drive it. And what we then need to be doing as clinicians is, is targeting these deficits. And what, whilst we acknowledge the complexity and these multiple factors, what we went into today in our presentation was, was very much focused on the mechanics and looking at what aspects of that can we affect or change that can be beneficial, but, but taking it into, con into consideration with these other key factors. But as Ian just presented there, in some individuals, their deficit lies predominantly around the hip. And what I then went on to talk about was uh, the, the way in which we can intervene from, a, from an exercise or rehabilitation perspective at a hip level. In some individuals, their deficit lies much more around the foot. And Alice presented some great uh, work and, and discussion in relation to what can we do at a foot level. And obviously that's, that's much more relevant to, to uh, the listeners here. But for some individuals, actually, it's, 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 the whole, it's the whole coupling, it's the whole chain that is, that is a problem, and it's the way in which they're moving. And, and Brad presented his work looking at movement retraining or run retraining specifically uh, as a means to affect this whole movement pattern throughout the whole lower limb. So that, that was the kind of, that was the scene we set, I suppose, really. Was. And, and from there, we, we took on each of these individual strands. And, and the way in which we try to conceptualize that is that, that no single intervention exists in isolation. And it may well be that, that a number of factors are needing to be considered, but that in a certain group, we need to bias a certain intervention. And that's driven by our assessment and, and identification of deficits. Yeah. Perfect. And I think one of the one of the things we should probably come on to talk about, and it was mentioned, I think, I think it was a question that we had from the audience actually, was how do we how do we make decisions? How do we decide when it's best to spend our time and our energy or our finances or the patient to spend these things uh, proximally versus distally versus versus movement wise? So let's can we tease that out as a team? Like for example, let's, we might as well start with you as you were speaking. Um, when 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 would we think that proximal is the, the, the big win? And, and some of what I talked about with the group was that it's not one single test in isolation, much like a, a number of other things, really. What, the way I look at this clinically is that I would observe a, a particular movement pattern, something like increased dynamic knee valgus or contralateral pelvic drop. And my sort of working hypothesis at that point would be okay potentially a proximal deficit could be driving that type of aberrant movement pattern so if i then put that up on put that individual up onto the couch and i assess them either using handheld dynamometry or, or manual muscle testing which i still use in clinic uh, you know are they demonstrating weakness in pure hip abduction abduction and extension combined or hip extension and if i'm seeing a combination of that movement pattern coupled with clearly identifiable weakness, then I think to myself, there's good rationale for intervening with an exercise intervention at a hip level. Perfect. We might, we'll probably come on to talk about what intervention looks oh, like right. in a bit, yeah. um, if that's okay. We, from top to bottom. Sure. How are you doing, all right? Yeah, yeah. Alice, poor Alice found out she was on pod chat live. So just to <laughs> give it context, Alice found out she was doing today's talk five days ago she had five days to prep for today and she did amazing when she got off the stage <laughs> you could just see that you know that dump of adrenaline craig when you when you get <laughs> off the stage, she's like, oh it's all over and i said to her right pod chat live tonight she found out about this at lunchtime so it's a massive <laughs> 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 I, owe, I owe her big time so yeah same question to you distally what, what sort of things are we looking at in your in clinic that make us think okay this particular uh, sufferer of pfp could probably uh, be, be better treated with a bit more of a distal focus. So I guess when we're looking at our patients with PFP, we are looking at the whole uh, distal kinetic chain. And we know that through the evidence that these patients are more inclined to have adduction from the hip, knee and internal rotation from the tibia. Um, they're, or they're more inclined to have rear foot um, eversion as well. But we must be aware that this isn't, these patterns are not exclusive or limited to PFP in that people with supinated foot types, people with neutral foot types also um, experience PFP. So I guess when we're considering um, testing, we look at treatment-directed tests. We're looking at the 
changes within the midfoot. So we're looking for navicular drop and drift and changes in the midfoot width on weight bearing. Um, and that's a really robust clinical test that could help to determine how effective an orthotic is going to be. Likewise, we can look at our patients performing a single leg squat, which is usually a provocative task in PFP. We can get them to stand on an orthotic. If we don't have an orthotic on hand, we can look at putting them on semi-compressible belt, um, a rolled up towel, a wedge. We can even tape their foot. And then we can ask them to perform that single leg squat. And if they're, if they're getting an immediate reduction in pain, um, and improvements in their movement patterns, that would be a really strong test or indication that perhaps an orthotic would be um, a suitable intervention to add to the optimal strengthening. Um, yeah, so I mean, they're, they're the main kind of treatment uh, director tests that we would be using that give us a little bit more evidence towards our orthotic prescription. We know that orthotics do have an effect in the treatment of PFP and that was kind of um, all came, uh, I guess we became more aware of this in, in recent consensus papers, 2014, again 2016 and 18, um, that recommended orthotics as suitable intervention and effective intervention for those patients with PFP um, as a short-term treatment option because it reduces pain in the short term. And just, just a little bit to add, like one of my first projects of my PhD was looking at outcome prediction really, fundamentally trying to I felt like there must be an answer to how can we predict whether they're going to do better with this intervention or that intervention. And, 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 the, and the conclusion of that systematic review ultimately said that everything is at a derivative state, nothing conclusive with regards to prediction. But there was some early work, some work done by our, our good friend and colleague, Christian Barton, that looked at you know, the immediate response, like you're describing, like immediate response to a, to a pre doses are they are they subjectively reporting ease of movement are they subjectively reporting a reduction in pain some of that early work still looks to be largely the only work that's kind of out there again our colleague we were over in Ulster last week he's, he's been looking at this midfoot width in a little bit more detail Mark Matthews and his, his PhD supervisor Bill Vincenzino over at UQ you know th these guys are kind of looking to try and understand if there's a predictor but they're still they're still not finding it fundamentally so so Whilst there's some great offerings and some really interesting stuff that's come out of today's discussion, I think we're still not in a position to conclusively sort of say that this is the way to go. That's the way to go. There's, some, there's some good evidence out there to, to sort of explore, I suppose, with ink. Yeah, and as, as you know, Craig, like we sometimes this debate about is, is patellofemoral pain a, a descending condition? Is it a top down problem or an ascending bottom up problem, or is it a bit of both? And, what about if we just give everyone orthoses and, 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 a, and a hip rehab program will probably get everyone okay eventually. And whilst that you could argue might be the case, we, we just, we're just trying to be a bit better than that. We're trying to be a bit better about identifying uh, how to get that individual, which is what they are sort of better rather than as you, you know, a component of this, this no, no resting books, no blanket approaches to these things. Yeah. Sure. No, I've, I've actually just scrolled down a few things to, to comment on. And, and that was one of them. It was the, uh, that, that sort of mentality you come up against of either or it's not either or it's both, you know, yeah. and I, and I, I get quite exasperated in some throwaway lines on social media about it being one or the other, <laughs> you know, which well, is just, yeah. The gender, depending on what one's agenda is, doesn't it? Um, and yeah. Brad now, and obviously Brad, I mean, I think in the room, a lot of people are, are fully aware of, 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 of the, well, you hope fully aware today, they were of the, the bottom up considerations, the top down stuff, probably the ones that work with physios. I, I suspect that would have been um, very common to them as well. But in my experience, the room of, the room of podiatrists are, are, are less uh, familiar with the stuff that Brad was talking about, which is the, sort of gait retraining and running running retraining and um so same question to you brad like what when someone comes in and uh, you spoke about this earlier so if you don't mind summarizing someone comes in and we sort of say okay should we intervene at the foot level should we intervene at the top end or should we change the way they move can you talk us through um what goes through your mind when we're sort of when would we put running retraining sort of front and center 
I mean, the way I, the way I go about it clinically, often, so if we look at recreational running and patellofemoral pain, whilst this could often be nicknamed runner's knee as a bit of a, a colloquial term, the incidence of patellofemoral pain in recreational runners is actually relatively low, it sits at around the 5-6% mark in comparison to some other groups, yet the prevalence is often higher than, than the, some of the data Simon showed you previously, kind of up towards the, the 35% mark. So it, it seems to be a condition that, that persists in runners more so than, than in some other groups. So often, if I'm seeing a runner for a second opinion, uh, often if they've had persistent symptoms and they've tried some more classical rehab approaches, potentially explored the role of foot orthoses, more often than not, you can see a pattern of, of, of unsuccessful, partially successful treatment. But, but across the board, the, the first thing that should, that should take you down that path, and it's difficult to attach the right word to this saying without a kind of drawing an attack from those that are perhaps less interested in biomechanics. But if we see particularly some, some kinematic markers that we at least understand to be associated with the condition, we steer away from talking about causality because we know the level of evidence there is relatively low, but we know that certain variables are associated with the condition and hip adduction is the biggest one. So if we see a runner who, upon a gait analysis, whether we're looking 2D, whether we're looking 3D, if we see a significantly greater peak hip adduction, contralateral pelvic drop, internal rotation, perhaps an overstride mechanic, kind of consistent with some of Chris Napier's sort of more recent excellent additions to the literature, and we see those things in the absence of the, the proximal muscle weakness, the, the quadriceps weakness, the, the rear foot predictors for orthoses, if we're seeing these faulty running mechanics for want of a better term in isolation or at least in superiority of some of the other predictors then that's clinically what what takes me more down that avenue whereas if i see a runner who has significant proximal muscle weakness i will generally start with exercise if i see significant rear foot motion or some of the treatment direction tests that predict success for orthoses i'll often go there first before considering something more akin to run retraining so there's there's absolutely no recipe and i think the argument of going about it in in an individual way for each individual patient very very much holds water yeah yeah actually w w one way i've tried to understand it and conceptualize it is that if you've got a say a runner with a foot that's totally rigid doesn't move and solid which obviously in reality doesn't happen to me, whatever you do, gait retraining or proximal is going to have no effect whatsoever because that foot doesn't move. Then at the other extreme, you've got that foot, that super flexible, light, moves really easy. Anything you do proximal is probably going to work really well. So when trying to decide which is more important or what you do first, there's going to be a line in the sand between those two extremes. So, you know, I, I, I just, that's how I try to conceptualize it. <laughs> So the comeback on that, which is interesting, is that you've got somebody who's got a stiff, rigid foot. Do you, do you still see patterns of increased hip adduction, internal rotation, mm. contralateral pelvic drop? Mm. I don't know whether, I wonder whether they're mutually exclusive or not. Just sort of drawing on your analogy. I, I'm not saying I've got an answer to that. Yeah. I'm just posing it back as a question because I, I do, I don't, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Sort of got <laughs> it goes against the sort of classic idea around kinematic coupling, doesn't it? But yeah. we know from from some of Yanni, this is work that we've we've sort of synthesised in a meta-analysis in, in previous years. That actually, if you look at plantar plantar pressures, it's actually increased peak load along the lateral column and, mm. and increased forces under the first and second mets that potentially predict the onset of patellofemoral pain in both in both walking and running, which so whilst we're talking about kinetics and, and not kinematics, theoretically, if we're yeah. seeing those increased kinetics in those regions, it goes against the kinematic argument of an increase in, in rear foot motion. So True, yeah. it, it, it's a challenging one. And, and I, got, I got asked a question actually today, which was about, you know, our, our, what do you think the role is of just a simple heel lift, you know, a, a little sort of eight mil heel lift? There's someone in the audience who found that it was quite effective in, a, in again, a subgroup of interesting 
tell us some of them. And I've, I, I certainly have found that effective in those who maybe have the more rigid foot, but equally have rigid ankle dorsiflexion as well. And therefore, they're not they're not necessarily the people who, um, or their path then of least resistance ends up with being one of, of you know, sort of increased dynamic knee pelvis, but not. It's driven by a rigidity, and I think there's Maston or, or an author, something to that name, who, who restricted ankle dorsiflexion and saw an increase in dynamic knee valgus as a consequence oh. of that. So actually, some of that stiffness might drive an increased mobility proximally. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Um, cool. And so actually, sort of the heel lift frees up some of that frontal plane motion in a way, gives them more ankle dorsiflexion, and then. They, they don't need to find that sort of transverse sort of coronal plane motion that then increases or, or inflict increased load to the tele mm. Yeah, well, if you believe certain, if you believe certain people, so many of them have tight calf muscles, so heel raises will work. But yeah, you know, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> I was going to say, you know, help us to, you know, let's get the shock absorption and more minimal shock absorption of foot obviously going to have an influence on the thing. Um, and I think there was, I don't know if you were referring to that before, but some of that work that I think they suggest in some way that you can have reduced um, shock attenuation in the foot and ankle is surely going to only onload the knee, increase the, the loading at the telephone joints. Because I think I think we can be I suppose just drawing drawing back on that and trying to reflect on what we've just discussed. It's, it's really interesting work. I think we can be really comfortable with that that sort of whole whole limb coupling motion of increased rear foot valgus, you know, internal rotation, consequential internal increased internal rotation of femur, you know, increased load of retro patella, and, and that being a, a quite a clear cut sort of pathway through development of patellofemoral pain. I think. You could then end up with a very sort of rigid picture, which is actually the, that's a bit more akin to what you're talking about, where that's just a that's just a loading problem, like frontal loading, just you know overload based, not dissipating of force um, particularly well. And then and then you've got those people that are sitting probably somewhere between the two. The middle, and then yeah. and then that that's where not only your assessment, but that having that flex within your program to sort of say, okay, well. You know, let's let's address your cadence or something and modify symptoms that way or let's do this heel lift or let's give your muscles increased capacity it might not be that you're weak but actually they need greater capacity to have the load facing that way through it and, and and that's where that's where your clinical reasoning comes from I mean, it won't surprise you to hear, Craig, that the, the, the conclusion here, I mean, these guys didn't stand up and profess, to, they didn't give everyone the answers because they were, they were very honest about not having all the answers themselves. So if people from the session wanted a, a, a flow chart or an algorithm, oh, I know. and you know, people, I'm not saying people there did, but you know, generally people do where they say, right, if you see X, you, you go proximity, if you see Y, you go this, I mean, we certainly that wasn't the message from today. Uh, it was to try and make people aware of the evidence base, know that they then need to add a layer of clinical reasoning and that there's an individual in front of them as well. Uh, conscious of time, I want to come on to yeah. the next layer of questions for all three of you, which was, um, okay, we've talked about what may want, what may kind of color your decisions in when to intervene top, bottom or, or movement wise. Um, could we talk a bit about what those uh, interventions might look like? How? Yeah, yeah, absolutely, and, and, and I think two, two, two points, not just, okay, what should we do approximately, but one question that I had ready to ask today, as a good chair should have questions ready to ask if, if when you asked for questions there were none, but that wasn't the case, there were, there were loads. One of the questions I was going to ask you is people that don't, or podiatrists that don't work with physios or alongside physios or have any link with physios, like, how do they do that? You know, how do you see that being delivered in, in outside of a, of a, of a setting? Yeah, and I kind of, I like this question for two reasons, really. It, it draws back on what I think is so critical with managing a musculoskeletal complaint anyway, but, but certainly pertinent with a telephemoral pain is that we've got to get this assessment right. We've got to identify where that deficit lies. So it's, so it's all, um, it's all well and good learning and, and, um, uh, how to deliver an exercise intervention, etc. But for me, what's what's critical is that we've got to be able to identify where the deficit sits. Because if we can be more specific to um, those particular deficits, then 
with our exercise intervention, then we're far more likely to have a desired outcome. How you then go about delivering it, I suppose, is, is dependent on where your skill set lies. I mean, I, I've spent my career trying to optimise the way in which I deliver exercise intervention and try to ensure that rehabilitation is targeted and, and is specific and, and is progressive um, to, to tackle the deficits that, that we've got of the individual in front of me. So, um, uh, so yeah, so I was just sort of saying, like, identify deficits, but equally like, make sure that it's appropriately targeted. And then what I walked the group through today was, was the fact that actually there, was, there are stages in order to make this a progressive program. We might start initially with a neuromuscular program, but if I'm observing somebody who's weak but moves quite well, I might not spend long in that period of rehabilitation. Equally, if I've got someone who's moving poorly and that they're weak, I want to make sure that neuromuscularly, the way in which they're recruiting those muscles around the hip is optimized. And that requires a high dose of exercise at a low intensity, and by dose I'm meaning high frequency um, and, and of relatively long duration or high repetition. What we then might progress that onto is strength endurance and then into strength phases where the load starts to ramp up, the frequency starts to decrease. And what we're making sure is that we're really um, being progressive through that program and, and making sure that these individuals are working at, at a high intensity. And one thing, thing that I flagged up towards the end is that, you know, our long-term outcomes with these individuals aren't brilliant. And, and actually some of the studies that have looked at long-term outcomes, a 12-month follow-up, what they actually delivered was a true strengthening program. So working people up to 70% of maximum into some discomfort at times, but um, really overloading the system for an eight or eight plus week uh, intervention. And the final stage of this is this power component. Now, something that we don't always think about with, with this group of recreational athlete or, or um, not even an athlete, but ensuring that that muscle that has now become strong because we've done a rehabilitation program effectively is, is converted into one that's not only strong but can be recruited quickly. So having a power or plyometric component towards the end of their rehabilitation program is what's critical. So if the podiatrist wants to super skill themselves with respect to that, then that's, um, then that's good. So Craig, I just, I've just told them that we need to be finished in the next 10 minutes or we're going to get locked inside the conference center. <laughs> okay. okay. You don't want, definitely don't want to spend the night in the conference center. Sure, that's so, fine. Um, we, we, we can be finished, yeah. Yeah, we're gonna, I've, got a, I've got a question though when we're ready, but yeah. There's just one comment I'd like to uh, address that was on the on the questions, other than the, the lovely compliments about all of our sports jackets. Which <laughs> um, it, there was a question from uh, our friend of the show, Adam, Adam Meekins, and he has commented off the back of our discussion about orthoses, about it being a bit, a bit suck it and see with orthoses with respect to femoral pain. So just, I know you, I just wanted to get these three guys' thoughts on them. Um, is that, uh, well, well, just a retort to that comment, because it's, it's, it, it is a bit, but it, it, that statement isn't a mile off, is it? But Well, no, I, I don't think it is. You know, if you look at the, if you look to the literature, if you look at some of Bill Vincenzino's early work, if you look at Cat Mills RCT in 2011, 40% or 47% of people, to be specific, will respond to an orthoses intervention positively irrespective of their foot characteristics. So that results in a number needed to treat of around the four mark. So number needed to treat, the lower it is, the better it is. That's, that's a good statistic for these, for these examples. But we also know from some of Bill and Kat's work, from Christian Barton's work, from some of Bill's even earlier work around low dye taping, we, we have these treatment direction tests that can predict the response to an orthosis. So rather than just going for a four in 10 chance of, of giving them to every patient, what we very much advocate is that you use these treatment direction tests to determine an immediate or very short term response in clinic, which will then give you the answer as to whether it should become a, a short to moderate term intervention. That, that's the way I would answer that question. Yeah. Anything you want to add, Alice? No, I agree. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So I can see just lob it in there. Well, I think yeah. that's the yeah. if we if we lob it in everyone and hope we will we'll we'll we'll, we'll, we'll get some success, but we just, we just don't know the, you know, the We want to be better. We've got to be better. Than that. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, Greg. What was? I was just taking a slightly different direction to get funding for research. You, you, 
often need to focus on national health priorities, diabetes, arthritis, et cetera, et cetera. I've, in recent times, I've seen a, a greater emphasis of the role of patellofemoral pain in knee OA. Now, what, or, or, you know, sorry, patellofemoral pain in younger athletes leading into knee OA in older people. Now, what I, my question is, is, is that a real thing or is that people exaggerating the link to get funding? because OA is a national health initiative. It's, uh, I'm being a bit cynical, but uh, you, you, what is the long-term prognosis? He does, he does it well. He does it well. Yeah. I mean, I, I would say it's, it's a theoretical paradigm. We have a, an improving understanding of what imaging features allow us to reach the decision that someone has patellofemoral pain versus patellofemoral arthritis so the the kind of classic study inclusion criteria of 18 to 45 and we want to exclude anyone over the age of 45 because of the risk of patellofemoral arthritis we again we can be a little bit better than that but theoretically if we think about the mechanical paradigm of, of a nociceptive output i think we can we're certainly not there yet but there's a developing understanding of how patellofemoral pain can theoretically lead to patellofemoral arthritis and how patellofemoral arthritis seems to be a precursor for subsequent tibiofemoral arthritis. So I think it's it's on the way to, to being a validated paradigm, but I certainly wouldn't say it's there yet, which is why the work is being done, obviously. Yeah. So. Actually, what, what, I, I'm somewhat familiar with literature. What, what are the long-term prognosis of patellofemoral pain in runners? What's the, uh, is there much being done on that? or? Specific not necessarily in spe specific in runners but yeah. you know, the, the papers we often lean on you know some of nat collins work throughout her mm. phd linka langhorst has done a very nice prognostic paper uh, alongside middlecoop at erasmus university you know gold standard conservative care that that being a, a multimodal approach that that we're sort of advocating here today you know sometimes up to one in four patients will have persistent pain beyond the beyond the 12 month mark there's some slightly more sort of less robust i guess is probably the best way to to term it studies um staff kulu is the as the lead author's name that suggests that kind of up to 80 percent of patients will have symptoms that persist at a 20 year follow-up some of eric ritro's work suggests positive changes in function at a five-year follow-up but persistent symptoms in, in a good 25 percent of, of patients so across the board and uh, good for us as as a group of clinical academics long-term prognosis at, at the moment probably uh, appropriate word is fair and mm. our aim is to to improve that yeah. going forward yeah no that makes sense so I'm just conscious that none yeah. of us are keen to sleep inside the conference <laughs> uh, apologies for cutting short and and um like I say, uh, thanks to these guys for not just their session earlier, but actually for agreeing to do this this evening as well. And if there's any questions um, that anyone's watching that we didn't, haven't got to, or they've got questions that have suddenly come to mind, pop them in the comments and then I'll, I'll flag them to, to these guys and they can sort of get the answers back to you. Um, yeah. Okay, no, thanks very much, guys. Look, I'll, I'll end, end the meeting. So thank you. And... Cheers, Greg. Thanks, mate. Yeah. Thank you.